Good morning. My name is Almut Schwacke. I'm a freelance um, Foley artist, sound designer and composer from Berlin in Germany. I've worked on a couple of indie games most of you probably don't know, like Rainbow Skies, uh, All Walls Must Fall, and just now Through the Darkest of Times. Um, I also was just hired as a contractor for Ubisoft, so you probably know them. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and first of all, let me say thank you for taking the time for attending my talk today, especially at this early hour. I really appreciate that. I see I have at least one Foley enthusiast in the audience. That's awesome. Oh, two, actually, three. <laughs> Yay! Um, let me tell you right away, my talk is not going to be a very game-specific talk. Instead, it's going to be focusing on a tiny part of audio production. So. Why am I giving it at a games conference? Uh, do you mind if I remove this downstairs? No, sure. Well, I love games. And audio, at least for me, is a huge part in the experience of playing games. And if I ask people about it, most of them will agree. But <laughs> there goes my script. Um, <laughs> So most people will agree if I ask them, like, does audio matter in your experience in playing games? And they will say, yeah, sure. But in my everyday work life, audio still often gets overlooked in terms of time and money budgeting. And I've been asking myself, why does this keep happening? Um, and of course, there are a lot of reasons, but uh, the ones that I came up with is it happens because Despite the fact that your ears are much better instruments than your eyes, despite this fact, most of us tend to be very visual creatures. We acknowledge the things we see way more conscious than the things we hear. Um, but it also happens because most of us don't know too much about the other professions that work alongside us on a game. Um, and this can lead to miscommunication, frustration, inefficiency, and it's even more crucial in indie games, where resources are scarce, and good management and good communication is key not to success, but to survival. So I'm sure that if we all knew more about the other professions working alongside us, if we appreciated the labor that the other people put into their work, and if we all shared more of the love we all put into our own work, not only would we all be happier and probably healthier, I'm sure that our games would be much better as well. So, I'm really happy for the chance today to present to you the, and I'm saying that super objectively, <laughs> most fun and most playful and most charming occupation in audio, Foley. <laughs> Um, how many of you have an idea what Foley is? Great, that's intimidating. <laughs> I thought you were all going to be noobs. No, uh, it's, it's awesome that you're all here. Um, about 12 years ago, I had no idea that this profession even existed. I just started out in movie sound post-production, and a friend approached me and said, hey, do you want to do a Foley edit for me? And I said, yes, but what is it? <laughs> and I learned the following, and to explain it to you, let me venture into the world of film a bit, because that's where Foley originated. So, when a movie is shot, the most important thing to capture on set is the dialogue of the actors, because if you can understand them in the end, you can understand the whole movie. So, on set, they use highly directional microphones. Um, you can imagine those like a dog perking up its ears to focus on sounds from a specific direction. So if one of these mics points towards the mouth of an actor, it captures the speech nicely, but all the other sounds, like footsteps, for example, or stuff that the act actor has handled, will be way more quiet. Thus, in the finished movie, those sounds will be either missing completely or way too quiet. And even if some of them are good, they are lost in the very instant the mommy gets dubbed into foreign languages. So. These sounds are later then recreated by Foley artists in a studio, um, in sync to the picture. And we cover pretty much everything that was generated by living creatures, except voices, 
Um, so that would be human and animal footsteps, clothes rustling, everything that was handled by those living creatures like glasses, um, door handles, cutlery, steering wheels and whatnot, chairs, everything. And in close communication with the person in charge of the sound design, we also do additional stuff like tire screeching, crash noises, etc. Um, at this point, a lot of people ask, can't you just pull those sounds out of a sound library? Because there are sound libraries for pretty much everything. And the answer is, eh, you sometimes can, but uh, in practice, it's still way you're late, Max. <laughs> I was missing your boo. <laughs> in practice, it will still be way quicker and more importantly, way better if a person does it. Now, why is that? Because so many little things make a huge difference. Um, take footsteps, for example. Where's my, there's my slide. No, go back. <laughs> um, what surface is your character walking on? Is it stone or maybe wood? or grass, or sand? Is it indoor or outdoor? What shoes are they wearing? Are they wearing boots, or high heels, or sneakers? Maybe they're barefoot. Um, what age is that person? The way that children walk differs considerably to the way that grown-ups or even very old people walk. Um, what mood is your character in? Are they nervous? Are they super relaxed? Are they sad? Are they happy? All these things taken into account make it really tedious and complicated to pull the right fitting sound out of a sound library and apply it to sometimes hundreds of times that the actor's foot meets the ground. <coughs> okay, so back to my first glimpse into this world. This friend had told me I could sit in with the recordings for that movie, the Foley recordings, and at the end, my job would be to cut all these sounds into perfect sync because naturally everything a Foley artist does is at least a bit late because we're reacting to the picture. I said, sounds doable. And I went to the Foley stage, which is what we call a studio specifically made for Foley recordings, on that first day of the recordings. And I was just, well, <laughs> I was just mind blown. <coughs> Um, I hadn't known how few is left in the production sound of a movie. And the whole thing was pretty dead, except the voices. Um, and once they started working on it, this Foley artist <coughs> brought everything to life. They kept recording and layering all these tiny little sounds, like lots of everyday sounds, like footsteps and the clothes rustling and some plastic bags flapping in the background of the picture. Um, straps on the hiking backpack of the actor when he moved. And they brought everything to life. Suddenly everything in the picture got an identity, a texture. And for me it was like going from 2D to 3D with sound. Um, and this was what go was going on in my head when I was in the control room of the studio. And the Foley artist is usually in a separate recording room. And when we took a break, I asked if I could sit in with the Foley artist for a while, and I could. And as soon as I opened the door, I was head over heels in love. <coughs> Let me take a sip. <coughs> this Foley artist was rummaging around in a room that looked like a, a messy garage full with things of all sorts and sizes. A bit like this, but hundreds of those things. And he kept manipulating those things into sounding what he wanted them to sound like. And I, I knew I had to be a Foley artist. <laughs> um, now let me show you what a Foley stage can look like. Sometimes it will look like this. <laughs> um, this is not the stage I was talking about. It's from a Finnish Foley artist. He just posted this picture on Twitter a few weeks ago. And I loved it so much that I asked him if I could use it in this talk and he agreed. <laughs> Obviously, this is a setup that you can only do if it's your own Foley stage. There are Foley artists who have their own stages and only they work in that stage. And then you can have this holy mess where only you know where everything is. Um, but there are also shared stages like this one. It's a tiny one in Berlin where I sometimes work. 
Um, and obviously those have to be more tidy because uh, a couple of Foley artists share this room and they bring their own stuff and there's also a bit of stuff st stored there. You can see there in the picture um, a few, do I have a pointer here? Yeah, uh, concrete, wood, uh, this is a dirt pit for walking on. Um, and on the walls they have storage space with things that are stored there. Uh, but whenever I go to work, I always also bring my own stuff, at least the shoes, because I have like tons of shoes for work. Um, and I, yeah, I always have a massive suitcase full of shoes and another one with different cloth types and another one with squeaky things. And um, yeah, because I, I just know my own things best and that's why I bring them. Um, the first person to do this kind of work was Jack Foley. Born in 1891, he lived to see the era when silent movies developed into... Thank you. <laughs> into movies with sound, and he was the first one to actually perform footsteps and all these little noises to moving picture. Um, Foley is a really excellent tool for creating intimacy, and that's what I love about it. Uh, imagine a cutscene where you see someone running down the street and you hear only music. Um, what happens to me then is I instantly know what the director wants me to feel, like which emotion am I supposed to feel, maybe heroism or fear or whatnot. But I also uh, almost every time experience quite a distance uh, between me and the character. It's more like a an example of what heroism could feel. But if you imagine the same cutscene with the footsteps and you hear the dirt uh, crackling under the shoes and you hear the heaviness of the body and you hear maybe a bit of squeaking of the clothes and something hectically rattling on the back, then I instantly know it's fear that they feel. And I... I feel that fear myself, so I, I get much more closer to the character. And that's what I find super, super rewarding about being a Foley artist. Um, but it's also a very demanding job. It's like playing hundreds of different instruments. Um, it's very physical work when I'm in the studio. I have to focus for hours on end. I'm on my feet a lot. I'm always carrying stuff around. Um, so maybe that's the reason that there are supposedly more astronauts in the whole world than there are Foley artists. <laughs> so yeah, I consider myself an astronaut of sound. <laughs> and why are there dollar signs there in this? I didn't put them in there. <laughs> but yeah, OK, let's make dollars with that as well. Um, my mission today is to take you into my universe in the hopes that you'll discover some love for those everyday sounds yourself and maybe develop a better vocabulary for communicating with your audio collaborators. Um, maybe you've been wondering what this whole setup is about. I'm soon going to show you some of the things I regularly do or use in my work. And when I'm done with that, I'm going to be joined by Shaws, a friend of mine, a voice actor, and we'll be um, giving a tiny live presentation. It's a short recap I wrote from, uh, for a game I really love. Um, and afterwards, we will hopefully have some time for Q&A. Um, but there will also be a bit of packing going on during the Q&A, so I'll be off stage when the next speaker arrives. Mm. Now, <clears throat> watching a Foley artist's work can be very peculiar. <laughs> now, when I'm in a studio, I usually work standing. Um, not all Foley artists do that, especially in Germany. Most of them sit down. I usually work standing. So, when I'm doing footsteps, I will be standing there, staring at the screen in this alert uh, posture. I do this. Something like that, so it looks really weird. Um, I'm going to put on better shoes soon, so it's uh, more audible. Just um, showing you how it looks like. Um, so 
what was I getting at? Yeah, it's a, it's a weird picture seeing Foley artists work, um, but bear with me. <laughs> so, where's my thing? I hope I don't forget anything because my my notes went missing. Ah, oh, there they are. Oh, you can put them there if that's better. That, that would be awesome. Um, yeah, on stage I sit down because not only can I handle all these things better when I'm sitting, but uh, I can also walk two people at the same time. So you have two people running, uh, walking down the street. Um, if this street should be more dirty, we don't add dirt usually in the studio because it often sounds way too gritty and it would disturb the dialogue that still supposedly should be audible <laughs> in the movie. We use ground coffee. Um, and that sounds good. But it also smells good, so you can't hear the uh, uh, smell the all the dirt in the studio so much. <laughs> um, what we often come across is animal feet, or no animals in general. Let's say they have a dog with them walking down the street, and if the dog is wearing collar, I could just do that by having like a bit of a, what's good a belt uh, rattling around. But what if that dog doesn't have a collar? Then, I'm sorry that I always go searching for stuff, but it wasn't easy to organize <laughs> everything on this stage. Um, we can use this. This is like a fake pearl thing. And if you tap it, it sounds like dog feet. Um, another animal I often come across in my work is the horse. And I'm sure someone has an idea what we use for horse hooves. Coconuts. Yes, <laughs> the coconuts. Um, those we would sometimes use on hard surf surfaces. Um, when it's a soft surface, you can also do that by using your cupped hands on your legs. You probably can hear that as well here. But you can try it on your own legs, cupped hands. <laughs> um, and the surface actually always plays a big role in deciding what I actually use for a sound. It's not that I can say, like, I always use this or that for that specific sound. Um, I remember very distinctly that once in, my, in the beginning of my career, I freaked out because one of my favorite shoes in one studio suddenly sounded like crap. And I called a very experienced Foley artist. I said, what is happening? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I know that problem. It used to make me nervous as well, but it's just, you have to try different things and just uh, find someone, something that fits. It's just that usually it's just tiny surfaces that we walk on, so a tiny stone slab. And sometimes these slabs have a resonance of their own, so sometimes Depending on the shoe, they make punk, 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 punk when you walk on them. So you have to find a different shoe. And that's just how it goes. So for the horse hooves, I could use the coconuts. Um, something like that. Or what is also sometimes used are plungers. Or, at some point, I got really crazy and bought myself a pair of actual hooves. <laughs> uh, it freaked my kids out, but, I mean, they eat meat, so I can have my horse hooves. <coughs> Um, 
Yeah, and you probably noticed that all these three things sounded different, but all of them sounded somewhat like horse hooves, so it really depends on the surface what you may want to use. And also on the aesthetic of the picture, of course. Like, uh, animation is a totally different thing than a, a documentary movie. Um, other animals that we often do would be uh, birds, bird flaps. You can do them with a piece of leather cloth, like, um, <laughs> do you hear that? Or you can also use a feather duster. Ah, okay, that's more wind noise for you. And again, it really depends on what kind of bird do you have? Is it small? Is it big? Uh, in what way is it moving? Does it do these very relaxed, uh, big flaps? Or is it like super nervous? Um, yeah. One sound, animal sound, I personally really love, but I almost never get to use it. So I have to show it to you today. <laughs> is the frog. It's a, I don't even know what you call this in English, a schnapps glass. <laughs> Short glass, right. Yeah, and if you use uh, different ones, you have different kinds of frogs. <laughs> um, let me have a look at my notes so I don't forget anything. Yeah, of course, I also have to show you how bone breaks are made, like some of you know already. But um, imagine you have this actor on your horse, uh, and he's supposed to fall down and break his arm. I can't tell him, please break your arm so we have a good sound. So I have to make it. <coughs> so you have the horse, and suddenly the horse goes like, and they go, oh no, and falls down and breaks his arm. <laughs> so. <laughs> That would be celery and not a real arm. Also, smells good. <laughs> Sounds good, smells good is always a good combination uh, and a rare combination in Foley as well. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, food in general is a very good source for Foley sounds. Um, one thing that a lot of you probably have come across at some point, is this? <sighs> Snow footsteps. And in here, there is a tiny uh, portion of cornstarch. And it's in a leather bag because otherwise it would be dusting the whole room. Um, but what if your snow is not fresh snow, but very frozen, icy snow. Then I use this. And what could that be? You had it for breakfast, probably, at some point in your life. Oh, yes! <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, but um, I don't always use food when I make actual food sounds. For example, when someone is cracking an egg into a pan, I don't use an egg because then my breakfast would be gone. And also, it would be a mess in the studio. What I use instead is a broken table tennis ball, which you can uh, crack nicely into your pan. and your egg is in the pan. But this pan wasn't heated, so my egg cannot be cooked, what a mess. Um, <laughs> so to cook it, you can knead some tape, and suddenly you have a frying egg. But of course it has to be taped uh, with actual egg sounds recorded on it, otherwise it won't work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tape in general is like awesome for lots of things. It can be used for um, 
leaves swaying in the wind, or if someone runs through a tree. Um, it can be rain if you close your eyes and don't look at the tape. <laughs> yeah, and fire and frying eggs and everything, so it's a very nice thing to have. Also grass footsteps. Um, I need a glass. <coughs> yeah, let's say I want ice cubes in my water. I don't use actually ice, cu ice cubes. They would melt and would be a um, huge mess. I use this. And uh, when I do this, I have to take care that I don't drink it. <laughs> I have drunk so much weird stuff in my Foley career <laughs> because I always get so caught up in the picture and then I'm like, oh wait, they're actually drinking. I, I want to hear that. And then I'm like, oh, I have snail shells in my glass. <laughs> I shouldn't drink that. Um, yeah, snail shells. I came across that by accident once, that they sound actually good as ice cubes. <coughs> um, what else do I have for you? Oh, yeah. One thing that's sometimes complicated to do is when we have to do sounds for rolling things, because rolling things usually mean I have to make a continuous sound. And since I'm bound to a very small space, uh, I need to do that in a small space. So I can't have wheels that can only go into one direction, because then I would ha have to go back and forth, and you would hear that. So instead, <laughs> let me go through my cracked eggs. Um, I have a, an assortment of wheels that can turn into every direction. So I can uh, do circles with them on the ground. So I have a continuous rolling sound. And depending on what, um, what object I actually want to do, I also attach um, resonant bodies to, that, to those wheels to give them the desired character. I'm going to try this with that thing here and hope nothing will break. <laughs> uh. Do you hear that there's a suddenly a, a much more body and, and metal? Uh, uh, I can't come up with a word. Do you hear the metal? <laughs> yeah, and I have a, an assortment of, of different wheels, so these are way more small and have their own resonance. Um, could be nice for a shopping cart, maybe. Uh, it doesn't work too much here. Yeah. Um, the resonant bodies that I just talked about are actually a huge part of Foley work. You can make um, small things sound big or just sound completely different by attaching other objects to them. Uh, for example, if I have this piece of tape here, I do it doesn't sound like too much, but if I attach it to something else, it could suddenly be a huge creaking door or something like that. So that's something we use, yeah, every day. <coughs> and the last thing I want to show you here is something that won't work perfectly here because I don't have the perfect surface, but it's so good. And you can all try it at home, so I need to show it. <coughs> I suppose probably everyone has one of these things a hot water bottle, uh, and best for this uh, are the soft ones with these ribs. So you put a bit of air into it, um, and then you find a really flat surface. The best is um, a f super flat stone surface, like bathroom tiles or something like that. And then you can do a car chase in your bathroom and do screeching tires. 
shit, it doesn't work at all on this surface. <laughs> oh no. It doesn't. Try it at home. It does work on a... <laughs> no, it doesn't work here. But you should try it. It's really good. It makes like... It's really good. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you want to try things on your own, um, I would dare you to do an experiment. You watch a movie that you know where, where an actor puts down a glass on the table. And so you watch that movie, have a glass in your hand and try to put it down in the exact same moment and the exact same fashion uh, that the character does it on screen. And what will likely happen is while you're staring at the picture to figure out when to put your glass down, you lose the sense of distance between your hand that's holding the glass and the surface. So in the end, probably the sound you will be making will be either way too late or too early or you make a very unelegant punk instead of a da dunk, which it really was in the movie. So what you can do to prevent that, it also happens to me a lot, <laughs> is um, I always connect my hand that is holding the glass with my other free hand with the surface that I'm supposed to meet. So while staring at the screen, I always have a, an idea of what distance I have to cover for putting down the glass. Um, another thing that I would encourage you to do is listen to your own footsteps. Um, how do your different shoes sound? How does the sound change when you walk from one room in your flat to another? How does the sound change when you're outside and it starts raining? Um, how do stair steps sound? Do they sound like normal footsteps? How do you do them when you want to make them sound like stair steps? Um, what I often do when I'm on the street and I think nobody's watching, I just did it yesterday on the way to the restaurant. <laughs> I follow someone and I try to imitate their way of walking. I try to get into their rhythm, but not only the rhythm, but also the way they walk. Uh, yeah, it's weird to do, <laughs> but I mean, no one really cares, I guess. And another thing <coughs> that's really helpful is um, since we're always walking in place in the studio, like we don't have a boom operator following us around. We have stationary mics, so <coughs> we have to walk in one place. When I'm walking down the street and actually walking, I sometimes stop uh, no, first I walk and listen, how do my <laughs> steps sound right now? And then I stop and keep walking in place and try to make it in a way that the sound doesn't change. And that's a really good exercise to do. So yeah, that was my demonstration part. Now I need a, maybe a minute to rearrange my things for our little live presentation. Um <coughs> I'm going to be <coughs> sorry, that restaurant yesterday was so noisy that it got rid of my voice a bit. <coughs> um, yeah, and we're going to uh, show you this little performance, which is a recap of a game that came out this year. Um, and I really, really love that game. I'm not paid by the developers to say that. <laughs> I really love it. Um, it's a point-and-click adventure called Unforeseen Incidents. Where's my, can you advance the slides once? Uh, yeah, this one? Yes. Uh, and I used to think that I hated point-and-click adventures, um, but this one really cured me from that thought. I really loved it. It, ha it has great characters, and it's also Foley-friendly, because um, I can't cover too much sci-fi live on a stage or shooting around. And this is a real world setting that's really nice for me. So I'll quickly introduce myself as well. Hi, I'm uh, Shors Haukes. I am uh, a voice actor um, from the Netherlands originally. Um, I live in Berlin as well, and that's where, where we met. Um, I worked a lot with uh, the independent game community, uh, organize some events, and I work at a place called the 
Game Science Center. If you're ever in Berlin, check it out. It's it's an independent museum with uh, interactive installations that all show um, different ways of playing. Uh, alternative controllers, VR, AR, um, games you control with all parts of your body. So it has some connection to this, games you connect with, uh, you control with your uh, voice and eyes. Um, yeah, but as a freelancer, I do um, voiceover mainly in, in Dutch. Uh, today I'll be speaking in, uh, in English, of course. Um, and usually I do things for. Uh, <laughs> we're we're preparing over here on the on the left, and I'll wait for your signal if we're uh, ready. <laughs> um, on occasion, uh, yeah. <laughs> on occasion, I do things for uh, games, but usually it's um, uh, museums, uh, educational videos, things like that. So. We're going to make it a little bit more dramatic uh, today, and we're going to take you on a. You should be good. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like go and. Uh <laughs> so we're going to take you on a short tour of what unforeseen incidents is all about. Yeah. Okay. So. Unforeseen incidents starts out in the small city of Yeltown, where a mysterious disease that causes fever, nosebleed and coughing fits is affecting the populace. Harper Pendrell, the town's easygoing handyman, who loves nothing more than his trusted multi-tool, gets a call from his friend, Professor McBride, who once again has a familiar problem. Hello? Harper, I have a problem with my laptop. I'm in the middle of processing important research data and the laptop won't charge! It's nearly empty! Say no more, Professor. I'll be right over. So, Harper runs over to his friend's place and fixes the charge cable with his multi-tool and some tape. On his way home, Harper comes across a young woman in bad shape. Hello? Jesus, are you all right? Get out of here! <coughs> Leave me! Leave me alone! <coughs> I'm going to call... I'm going to call our RHC. The RHC is a private health contractor who is supposed to take care of the infected. No, you idiot! You're leading them right to me! <coughs> Go to the hotel, find Halliwell, and give her the envelope in my bag. And then things unfold rapidly. Well, at, at least here on stage, because otherwise it will take a few hours. In his quest to find this woman called Halliwell, Harper Pendrell rummages through the ho hotel's guest book, calls and interrogates a few of the guests, and even solders a broken TV back to life to distract the receptionist. He finally manages to find reporter Halliwell and give her the envelope. They find a coded message inside, and they go on a journey to decipher it. Things turn out to be really, really bad. The private health contractor, RHC, who is supposed to take care of the infected, actually lets them disappear. It even turns out that RHC are the ones spreading the disease. But, but why and how? To find out, Harper Pendrell needs to search dumpsters to find useful things like his neighbor's tights, disguise himself as an RHC member by crafting himself an RHC suit out of a poster, glue, and a protective suit. He fixes a car with uh, valuable car parts he found on his buddy's junkyard. And he drives to an RHC camp to get a blood sample of an infected person. While Halliwell distracts the guards, Wohin, wohin fährt dieser Bus? Uh, kann ich bitte die Weinkarte sehen? Harper sneaks in through the fence, takes some photos, and gets discovered while searching a tent and just barely, barely manages to keep his cover. He then gets arrested by a ranger with a gun who thinks Harper is one of the RHC. I saw what you guys did! What the hell is happening here? 
He meets a farmer in a rocking chair who wants to trade his radio for a sandwich with hot sauce. He steals some car keys, talks to a weird guy slurping a drink, and delivers cupcakes to an eccentric painter who faints in a cave. Oh. <laughs> We're going to do that one again. Why? Why? No? Okay. No? I'm not fainting. <laughs> so, uh, to an eccentric painter who faints in a cave. Uh, so, he makes a fire to keep him warm and brews him a revitalizing cup of tea. He finds an old diary, gets caught by the bad guys, and he even gets infected by them with their weird canisters containing the Yellowtown fever virus. But mysteriously enough, Harper doesn't die. So on he goes, developing the photos he took using instant coffee, baking powder, and vitamin C, while Halliwell writes articles and does research like a pro. Was hidden by the <laughs> Harper inflates a rubber, uh, rubber boat and he doesn't hesitate to row it to an unknown island and smash some glass doors to get in what to appears to be the headquarters of the criminal organization. And we're not going to tell you what happens in the last chapter of the game because then you know it all and we'd spoil the rest. Uh, instead, we recommend that you just check out this game. It's really, really cool. Um, made in Berlin um, and we're big fans, so um, just do that. Um, thank you very much. So, um, yeah. Am I back again? Yes. That was a wild one. <laughs> Usually I have a bit more time between things to happen, but uh, I needed to compress things. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, any questions? I will be packing my stuff if that's fine while answering the questions. Um, yes. Hello, thank you. Hello, thank you very much for amazing talk. Like this, this is also thank you. <laughs> uh, I think everyone wants to ask the same question. How are you coming up with these ideas? Because it, like some of it is unbelievable. Uh, it's a mix of things. Um, I, I didn't have a steady mentor, but I do have a couple of very experienced Foley artists that I can ask when I don't know how to make a specific sound. Um, it's also just lots of trying out stuff, and sometimes it happens by accident, like with the snail shells. I, I think it was, it's really bizarre. I've been doing it for quite a while now, but pretty much on every movie I work on, I feel like a complete noob, because there's always something I haven't done before, and then I'm like, <gasps> how do I make that sound? Um, <coughs> And that's very stressful, but also somethi something I really love about it. I always have to be creative. And I think the snail shells were, there were suddenly ice cubes in that glass, and I hadn't seen them when I had watched the movie before the recording. And I was like, fuck, do I have anything that I can put in there that might rattle around? And I had some snail shells for whatever reason in my <laughs> stuff, and I threw them in, and it worked. And I was like, ah, nice. So it's really, uh, I think most of it is paying attention to the stuff I do when I'm not working on Foley because sometimes I'm like, oh, this sounds like this and that. It's also collecting lots of things. Um, it's very nice. I can collect all the things that other people throw away. Um, I also often collect things that are lying on the street that other people have thrown away. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a mix of those things. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. <coughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. Thank you very much for that. That was incredible. <laughs> Quick question. Yeah. Is this all of your props, or do you have more at home that you use elsewhere, or is, is this just a portion of the, uh, the yeah, items that you use? It's just a tiny portion. Um, I have a... And it still, my stuff is a tiny portion of what the people have that have been in the business for 30 years. I have a room that's like... I don't know, maybe 10 square meters, and it's like completely cramped with things. Um, 
Because, uh, for example, from the same thing, you often need a couple of variations to cover all the sounds. Like one glass isn't enough because there are shot glasses and wine glasses and small and big glasses. And sometimes the things don't even sound like what you would expect them to. Sometimes a huge glass sounds super small when you put it down and then you have to find something else. And um, yeah, so I, yeah, I have lots more. <laughs> Yes. So you mentioned the frogs. Yeah. Yeah. Bah, okay. So you mentioned the f the frogs is one of your favorite sounds. I'm wondering what are some of your other favorites, and why do you think they're your favorites? In do they give you mo a lot of joy to make, or is there something connecting the favorites? Or um, I don't know if there's something connecting them. Um, the frogs are favorites because they're so bizarre. No one expects a shot glass um, to make a frog sound. Uh, other favorites? I, I really love all things metal because um, it's a very satisfying material. Uh, you can get lots of great noises out of it. Metal is also very good thing to use for resonance um, because it rings nicely and you can have squeaky things and um, but I also honestly really enjoy the the tiny sounds that lots of people don't maybe don't notice like footsteps when I work on a movie I think 70% of my work or maybe more is doing footsteps because pretty much every movie has tons of them um, and they're so important. I, I love the sound of someone work walking on dirt. <laughs> um, yeah. And other little things, like um, when you have an intimate scene and, and you have people touching each other and you hear the skin, that's also one of the most difficult sounds to make for me because there's pretty much no sound that comes out when you... Uh, touch your skin, but you have to make it work somehow. And sometimes people are like really slow in the movie. And I'm like, how am I supposed to make a sound to that? But you somehow have to make it work. And I, I really love it when you, when it's not a gigantic uh, spaceship, whoa, I'm blown away sound, but more the little things that make me really feel like I'm there with the characters. Yeah. <coughs> Um, so do you record, hey, <laughs> do you record everything when you, when you work, do you work on your own entirely or do you have somebody recording and just, you know, taking care of all the, um, all the other stuff while you are actually doing the Foley? Um, when it's for movies, I'm always in a team. There's a recording engineer and, um, I love that kind of work most, like the, the back and forth between the recording engineer and me, because it will be like, um, often sounds that I make sound different on my side of the microphone than they sound on the other side of the microphone. So I will try on a shoe, for example, and go like, okay, how's this? And then the recording engineer will be like, yeah, great. Or ah, ha do you have a shoe that's maybe more heavier or whatever? So I try on something different. Um, so that's how it would be for movies. Um, when working on games, I usually do everything on my own. But the line between Foley and field recording and sound design in games is super blurry anyway, uh, because it's not linear. And like for, for movies, Foley always has the thing of reenacting. Like it's a lot of about yeah, acting what the character on screen is. It's not just getting the right timing, but really be there with the actor. And that's not the same with games. Um, so for me, it always feels more like field recording or sound design when I do this kind of work for games. Hi. <coughs> uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting. So if I was going to go talk to my audio director and try and convince him to use a Foley artist as opposed to just using sound designers and libraries, existing libraries, uh, what should I tell him that 
the folio artist can offer uh, that we why why we w should hire a folio artist and why uh, we should use. Um, that's a difficult question. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I would well like to see the video first <laughs> before saying that. <laughs> um, well, I guess Foley artists are just very um, experienced in paying attention to detail uh, and making all the everyday sounds work. I've come across a lot of footsteps in games that I really didn't like. Uh, and it's been huge games sometimes. I just recently came across a game and I was like, can I exchange that sound? <laughs> yeah, I, I clock, clock, clock. Or grass footsteps that are like, <laughs> and I'm like, eh. Um, so yeah, I think that's where Foley artists really shine, that they um, make all these little everyday sounds work and put you in a real setting. Uh, so it, it probably also depends on your game if, if you would be uh, better off hiring a Foley artist. Um, oh, I also forgot to mention that, like the difference between uh, Foley's for movies and games. Um, in a movie, I would always try to make the sounds as lively as possible. Um, while in games, it's more a thing to make the same sounds of one kind pretty similar to each other. Like if you have, uh, if you want ten variations of your uh, character in combat boots on concrete you want 10 footstep sounds that are pretty similar to each other and you don't want one or two to be really distinctive and stand out because if you then trigger them in succession um, randomly or whatever, you, people might notice that there are one or two sounds that really stand out. Um, yeah, that didn't really have to do with your question. <laughs> I needed to mention that. Um, yeah. Anything else? Hello. How much editing do you do? Are the sounds as good as they come from the recording, or do you edit it heavily? Um, it also depends. Um, when I work on a movie, it's not my part to edit, usually. Uh, in the movie world, everything is separated really uh, distinctively into different professions. So someone else usually does the Foley edit. Um, but we usually try in the recording studio to make the sounds fit in as well as possible because there's not much time. Uh, people will be busy cutting everything in sync um, a lot of the time and then they will do a quick leveling pass to see that it fits in with the production sound. And then of course the mixing engineer will go through the whole thing and mix everything, but they don't have time to uh, touch every track of footsteps I've done. They will do like maybe a, a bit of reverb uh, to add reverb to the sounds and uh, do a bit of leveling, but they won't go like, ah, these concrete footsteps uh, sound a little bit too blah, blah, blah. I'm going to EQ them that way and those that way. There's just no time for that. So we really try to uh, get the most fitting sound as possible. Um, yeah, but when I, of course, when I record myself for games, it's also different because, um, yeah, as I said, it's not linear. I, I have to cut things up into single assets and see how they work, and that's sometimes uh, different than uh, with linear stuff. I think I really should get off the stage, shouldn't I? Uh, we're unfortunately running out of time, <laughs> but uh, I think you can uh, ask some questions later in the corridor. Uh, let's create some clapping sounds because this lecture really deserves it. <laughs> well, thank you.